Human beings have been curious about the world for a long time. Although we discovered a lot about the universe and its structure, we are still trying to understand the mystery of the human mind and how a fully unconscious flesh like the brain can create a fully conscious mind like we have. Artificial intelligence can transform society, impacting the nature of work, economy, health, war, transportation and even our religious beliefs. But can AI really improve how medicine is done nowadays? What are the consequences of having driverless cars like Tesla's in our roads? And what about war? Is it a good idea to use autonomous weapons to replace human armies? Can we upload our mind to a computer and achieve immortality? Those are just the tip of the iceberg of questions that we will discuss here with some of the most renowned ethicists and artificial intelligence researchers in the world. This is the age of artificial intelligence. Hello, my name is Wolf Loh. I'm a postdoc a researcher at the International Center for Ethics and uh, Sciences and Humanities at the University of Tübingen. My main research areas are ethics uh, of AI and uh, robotics, questions of privacy, um, but I also work in political philosophy and social philosophy. Artificial intelligence, the term has been through, I think, uh, uh, most media, but what is mostly meant by it is um, algorithmic processing by using big data and machine learning. Um, and these are technologies that are pervasive, that are moving in, I think, basically into every realm, more or less, if we let them. And the question is whether we should let them. So should we, for example, decide, let an algorithm decide who gets parole or who doesn't get parole? Uh, broadly speaking, we have to be more nuanced to talk about specific applications and uh, what role AI is playing, uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, uh, in a political context, an ethical context, and a commercial context. I think there are immediate ethical concerns because, you know, as the role of AI grows, there's a larger and larger trend to uh, displace human choice towards machine decision making. Uh, and whenever that's the case, we're going to have some interesting questions to ask. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Ghent in Belgium. My main area of interest um, are um, new technologies, bioethics and uh, the ethics of discrimination. I've worked on immortality and cryonics as well. I think that with like most uh, new technologies, um, there are good use and possible bad use um, of it. And um, the question is which ones are the good use and uh, how can we discover them before it's too late. So when you think of artificial intelligence, for instance, applied to medicine, like um, to uh, sort of replace doctors or help doctors um, saving lives, um, that seems to be like a really good use of artificial intelligence. But you can also imagine the worst case scenario in which an evil artificial intelligence um, develops and and decides to take over the planet and destroy all the humans. And that's obviously a scenario that um, attracts a lot of interest in philosophy and also in, in arts, um, because it's something we were really scared of. So I guess there are very good ways of using artificial intelligence to enhance the goals that we have and to achieve good things. But of course, we're not sure about how much we can influence artificial intelligence when it becomes too intelligent, and that's the question. Ah, we should certainly think carefully about autonomous weapons, as we should think carefully about actually using any weapons. Um, so, yes, we have to think about the dangers, particular dangers with autonomous weapons, whether people will use them in a way more likely than they would use weapons that have to be directly targeted because there's some human involvement. Um, and it might, you know, or it might be that it makes the, the barriers to using 
lethal force even less than they are now. So um, I do think we should be very careful about them. I'm not at this stage ready to say that you know, they should never be used or that we should never build them or direct them, um, because clearly there can be benefits in saving life as well. Um, but we, we certainly need to be very careful about how they're used. My name is Paul Thagard. I'm at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And I work in many fields connected with philosophy, psychology, and artificial intelligence. For a long time, I've been concerned with building computer models of how people think, how they solve problems, how they're creative, how they use analogies, and how they learn. Well, it's certainly true that humans do a lot of killing in war that's unjust. They get angry or they get afraid and they kill innocent people. And you might suppose that the robot would be more immune from that. But there are other things that robots just don't have. Like a big part of human ethical judgment isn't just some absolute principle, it's empathy. Actually caring about or having a feeling about it. And so from a military point of view, maybe you don't want to have soldiers with empathy, but from an ethical point of view, that's very good, so that a soldier in a complex situation <clears throat> can have empathy for potential victims, and I think that should go into the kinds of thinking they make about who they're going to shoot. So given that there's no prospect of making robots with any kind of empathy or caring or, or ethical feeling, it's really important to think that they're not going to be superior ethically to what a human in that situation might be. My name's Josh Jowett. I'm a lecturer in law at the University of Newcastle in the United Kingdom. My research interests are really to do with the nature of law and the connection between law and morality. So it's a, it's a big problem um, in the legal sphere at the moment as to whether or not individuals or even a state should be held liable for autonomous weapons that are used extraterritorially. So in the United Kingdom at the minute we've got, um, we, we voted for military intervention in Syria a few years ago. Um, autonomous weapons were deployed um, and these drones um, attacked several civilian targets in error. The, the, the operators said they didn't know that they were innocent civilians but they, they were, they were attacked, their property destroyed and several family members um, were killed. So the current legal questions being brought before the UK courts are all around, well, was the human input enough to override the autonomous nature of the weapon? Was the programmer somehow at fault? Uh, was the uh, human working behind the scenes in a position to have intervened? Uh, could he have known that they were to intervene there? Or is all of that too speculative and should we simply uh, impose liability on the state? I think it's important to kind of place all of this within a kind of uh, socio-economic context, right? So there's a strong pressure to make weaponry uh, automated and autonomous such that we don't have to have a team of people, you know, directing and making decisions about, say, for example, a deployment of a drone uh, and whether or not to use it to strike. Um, and so the investment towards this, these more autonomous systems uh, is ongoing and the numbers are astronomical in the United States alone. On the other side, you can't hold the weapon responsible, uh, both because it doesn't have the kind of autonomy that, of a person, but also because you can't punish it. Uh, and then lastly, there's a concern that those deploying the weapons uh, have, uh, well, an inability to be able to project what the outcomes will be. Because again, you're dealing with a massive amount of data that's going into these systems that help to determine, you know, the learning process for how to go about targeting. Um, and so this is one of the kind of fundamental concerns about these systems. There has been a big discussion whether they should be in the loop or on the loop or could be out of the loop, in the loop meaning, um, they have to actively decide, um, have to actively uh, push buttons on the loop, meaning 
the auto autonomous system can do the decision, but somebody has to supervise it out of the loop, meaning that um, um, humans have no say or have no no a part in the in the decision process. And I think, as far as the debate goes, we're, dis we're discussing whether humans with regard to autonomous weapons should be on the loop or in the loop. Nobody that I know really uh, suggests that they, sh they should be out of the loop. I think there are analogs to more conventional contexts that are really quite useful. So, for example, in conventional uh, means of war, those sending out unreliable troops into the field, let's say someone who sort of psychological problem or, or something along these lines, would be held liable for whatever those people do, right? Uh, and in the same way, if you're sending out autonomous weapons where you don't necessarily know what the outcomes are going to be, uh, well, that's sending out uh, an unreliable agent. Uh, on your, and, and as a result, there's this kind of liability that can be put towards the institution and the leadership of that who, who deploy that. So a second major issue uh, with regard to autonomous weapons is the way in which it makes uh, fighting so much uh, less expensive, both in terms of uh, you know, lives that might be lost, but also the economic investment in training and deploying uh, individuals into the field. Uh, and this kind of radically changes how we think about proportionality and warfare, right? So, uh, and so one of the major concerns is as our proportionality calculations get shifted by this much cheaper and more economic mode of fighting, both in terms of economic costs and cost of lives, uh, this will decrease the threshold that uh, needs to be met for nations to go to war or the like. So this is. This is a, also obviously a ethical concern. Autonomous car trolley cases work on the assumptions that one day autonomous cars will be, the AI in autonomous cars will be so quick that they can decide um, if there is a dangerous situation. So for example, the car is going over a bridge there are three kids running after a ball behind three uh, behind behind a car, and on the other hand, on the other side, there's an old lady on a bicycle. So the car could do three things. It could it's not possible to stop in the right time. So you could either kill the three kids, you could kill or hurt uh, um, the old lady, or it could drive off the bridge and then seriously hurting the passengers, you, um, or even killing them. And that works on the assumption that the autonomous car is not doing something wrong. It's not going at a high speed or anything. So it's, it's, uh, it's staying within the traffic laws. And also, secondly, um, that the AI will be quick enough to assess the situation and make a decision. So those are the assumptions. And under those assumptions, because a human driver couldn't do it, a human driver would just react and whatever the reaction would be, we, we're not responsible in the sense because our, our decision mechanism isn't quick enough. But if that's the case, then the question becomes what should the AI do or rather how should we program it, right? And there have been different solutions. Um, um, I put forward one solution in a paper. I think the problem is with these cases, I think they have to be solved because of acceptance reasons. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna buy a car and sit in a car where I don't know what it's gonna do. Um, and I think we need a societal discussion for this in order to, to solve these cases, but come to, a, come to a workable conclusion. As of now, the German Federal Ethics Committee um, um, handed out like a preliminary solution to this problem, saying an AI, an autonomous car should always break and it should never swerve, it should never go switch lanes or anything. And that's a decision, that's not like, it seems to be that's the natural cause for a car to, to go, right? But it's, it's also making the decision, right? I mean, so you can't, you cannot not decide these cases. Associate Researcher at the Research Center in Applied Ethics at the University of Bucharest. 
I teach business ethics and philosophy at the Bucharest University of Economic Studies. In my field of research, I work on political philosophy and applied ethics. When it comes to political philosophy, mostly on questions having to do with classical liberalism, libertarianism, and reading hard libertarianism. When it comes to applied ethics, things having to do with intellectual property, copyrights and patents in particular, and also things having to do with robots and sex. A lot of people find it controversial. Some people, for example, are, are actively campaigning against uh, the deployment and use of sex robots. There's this website called Campaign Against Sex, sex Robots. And the main argument that, that uh, people like Kathleen Richardson have is that if we were to live in a world in which we would have sex robots, this would actually lead to more objectification of women. But on the other side of the debate, there are people arguing actually in favor of doing this because this would actually mitigate some of the negative consequences in place when we have a sex trade that actually involves human beings, right? The sex trafficking world harms directly human beings. Some people like David Levy, for example, have been arguing ever since 2007 that, for example, a market for robot sex prostitution would actually be better in this sense, right? From a principled point of view, if you could reduce the negative impact that the illegal sex trade has on human beings, you should do whatever you can to do it. True, sure, it's an empirical claim whether robot sex, right, would do it or not, right? Because as, as things stand nowadays, we don't know how the robots of the future will look, will look like. Uh, there are some, some models. One of, one of them is called Harmony IA which is the, let's say, most advanced example of, of a robot, a sex robot nowadays. It's fully customizable when it comes to her body, uh, but unfortunately the head alone costs $10,000. The starting price is $10,000. But it's, it's able, for example, to be a part of your like day-to-day -day conversation. Harmony can tell jokes. Uh, and I guess we could be, at least, in principle optimistic that in the future, uh, the future sex bots would mimic really closely the way in which human beings would function in such a context. And if this would happen, I guess it's fair to assume that more people would opt for that instead of, of, of uh, resorting to, let's say, illegal solutions nowadays that, that we have on the, on the sex market. もちろんその売春とか性犯罪はなくなるっていうことは一時的にはあり得るかもしれないし一部の人にとってはすでにセックスロボット的なものが不可欠なものにはなってると思うけれどもやっぱり人間はそのセックスロボットだけではなくて生身の人間と関係を持ちたいっていうような人は一定数いると存在し続けると思う。でもそれは時代が変わると変わってくるかもしれないし、今どうこうよりも将来どんな性能のセックスロボットが出てくるとか、セックスロボットがすでに自分たちが子供の頃に当たり前の存在になっているような社会になれば、自然にセックスロボットを受け入れていってしまうかもしれないし、そして我々は非常に人工的な方法で。子孫を残していくっていうようなことをするし始めるかもしれない。それは時間が経たないとわからない。Well, I do think it would be a very good thing if it reduced the market for、uh, sex workers who are being trafficked,、um, who are ba basically have no choice but to be in the sex trade.、Um, that's a very bad thing. I, I don't know really whether sex robots would ever get good enough to eliminate. Uh, the desire of some people for、um, a human being.、Uh, so I'm not sure that it'll succeed in that, but、um, it might, for example, be useful for people who are,、um, for one reason or another,、uh, alone and unable to have sex with a human being. And maybe they don't want to pay、um, an, uh, you know, for uh, sex worker services anyway,、um, even if it was somebody who was not actually trafficked. But,、um, So,、uh, I think that they could have various uses like that for、um, you know, providing you know, what, what might be a sort of second rate kind of sex compared to sex with somebody that you're passionate about and really care about.、Um, but 
it's still better than nothing for many people. Um, so in that sense, I think it's probably a good thing if they're developed. So this is, this is an objection that, that bioconservatives, for example, could, could employ against the deployment of sex robots, right? If sex with robots would become so enticing, right, most people would have sex with robots instead of having sex with human beings. Now, from a purely, let's say, uh, principled point of view, I don't see this as being problematic. It might be problematic due to the fact that, well, reproduction nowadays involves, right, having sex, most of the times at least. But, I mean, technology could mitigate the negative consequences of this, right? We have artificial uteruses. Mammals have been born, if I'm not mistaken, two goats were born inside an artificial uterus last year. So it's not impossible to imagine that in the near future, we would constantly have sex with robots for pleasure. We would have personal friendships and sex with other human beings, and we would reproduce our species with the use of, of uh, artificial uteruses. So I, I don't necessarily see this as problematic because most of the time, the meaning of what acts signify or symbolize are historically contingent. I don't think that there is anything inherently good or bad in the way in which we conceive currently romantic relationships, right? 700 years ago, people would have talked about romanticism uh, and romantical relationship quite differently than, than we nowadays do, right? So if it's just something contingent, let's look at what makes us happier. I'm David Harris-Smith. I'm at McMaster University in Canada. I'm an artist who works in the area of robotics and artificial intelligence. You know, the, it, it, because we are attempting to predict the future, uh, certainly we can, we can see uh, that there is uh, worker displacement by, by uh, certain technologies. There has been historically, um, and I think the, the argument that people are making who have this hypothesis is that this time, this technology is uniquely um, going to alter uh, you know, the human labor market in such a way that, that uh, there will be no opportunity for recover, to recover in another sector. And I think to do that, we're, we're fortune telling. We don't really know. We, I think we can't predict the future. Um, but I think one thing that we can do is we can anticipate uh, the importance of, of social contribution and, and transparency of technological development so that, um, that we, uh, as I, I, I think I mentioned earlier, this idea of socializing our technology is, is key to, uh, to remaining in, in step uh, with technology so that the technology is actually meeting societal needs uh, uh, rather than um, you know harming uh, people. I don't think there's anything in you know implicit or in inherent in the technology itself that necessitates you know that, that human um, um, the ability for for human beings to have meaningful work you know or that these two things are you know, incompatible. I don't think that there's a necessary incompatibility between AI and, and meaningful work. Well, there's clearly major threats. If you look at self-driving cars, for example, what's going to happen to taxi drivers and Uber drivers and truck drivers? That's millions of people. So if those jobs all go away because it's all automated, then that's a lot of jobs that have been lost. And there are lots of other fields where jobs could be threatened as well. Sometimes, though, automation opens up the possibility of other jobs. And some people say, well, maybe it won't be so bad. But if you just look at the driving professions, there's certainly going to be millions of jobs lost. One of the worst things that may happen um, is that it creates mass unemployment, that it um, takes jobs from people who are not able to retrain and get other equally satisfying jobs. And if we don't deal with that with good social policies to um, help people to support themselves and to find interesting and worthwhile things to do with their lives, then that could be a real social disaster. This has more and more coverage. Uh, this idea of technological unemployment 
which is the, the specter that, that, that's looming, at least in the post-industrial world, is something that a lot of philosophers, economists, and, and social scientists generally are trying to address, right? Now, you could adopt, let's say, a techno-optimist position, right? Which I sometimes at least adopt, right? Uh, sure, the magnitude of what's happening nowadays is way bigger than what happened during the Industrial Revolution, right? But it's another example of what Schumpeter, the famous Austrian economist, labeled creative destruction, right? If we would have robots doing most of the jobs that human beings are doing, societies would have more resources to employ towards other ends, right? This is the process in which people would diversify, let's say, the jobs that they have. So at least in principle, there is no potential future in which people would be dramatically, let's say, unemployed. But techno-pessimists are saying that, well, we actually don't know how AI will look in the future. We don't know this. And maybe we would need some sort of a tool in order to address and mitigate the potentially negative consequences to the worst off. And this is a thing that people from different backgrounds, like from, from I don't know, socialists, social democrats, to even libertarians, Right? I mean, I kind of agree with something like a universal basic income in this context, drawing from, from, uh, from economists like Friedman, like uh, Friedrich Hayek, like Mats Volinsky, Michael Munger. It would be a tool in order to do this, both because justice requires this. Right? We should take care about the least well-off from, from society, but also because I guess our society would prosper well, lots of people have had that fantasy, from Karl Marx to John Maynard Keynes. The thought was that in a modern society, people won't have to work very much because there'd be lots of robots to do things. Well, that might be good if people would have more time for productive activities, such as art and music and other things that can satisfy the need for competence. But there's also a risk that as the technology improves, you'll get more and more inequality just as the trend has been in that direction for the last 20 years. So the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and then people who are at, down at the bottom aren't having opportunities to do things like art and music because they're living in tents on the sidewalk, as is already true with a lot of people in big cities. So if AI was used to increase the overall level of prosperity so that more people would have more time to do things that they see as value, that would be great. But on the other hand, there's a risk that AI will simply be used to increase inequality and so there'll be more people living in a more marginal existence and so the amount of need satisfaction will go down rather than up. A lot of this depends on the actions of government and also of, of companies. There are questions about what technology can be produced and what technology will be produced and these are being made at the level of governments, that's the political side of it, but they're also being made at the level of particular companies. Fortunately, some of the companies, at least profess to have a big concern about ethics and the social applications of what they're doing. And if they act in responsible ways, that would help a lot without having them directly regulated by the governments. But it's certainly a, a huge political issue if you're dealing with questions like employment and housing and the degree of, of happiness and need satisfaction of the people. That's something that every government should be concerned with as well. I think universal basic income might be an essential part of a solution, but I don't think that just giving people enough money to live on without giving them something that gives sort of purpose and shape and structure to their lives um, is going to be enough. And uh, so, you know, we may have to be more creative in finding activities that uh, people can do, even if they don't need it for the money because they're getting a universal basic income, but that they still find sufficiently rewarding um, you know, rather than just uh, sitting around wondering what to do next and maybe in some cases getting up to trouble. Robots feel any sort of entitlement when it comes to their income, right? You, you, you're not going to have like robots on strike because uh, the income tax is too big on them. It's having to do with whether or not people, the poorest from the globe would spend those resources on, I don't know, alcohol and tobacco, or they would spend it on enhancing themselves or, or bettering their condition and the condition of their family. And there, there's a wide array of, of empirical studies like this of international NGOs that instead of, I don't know, delivering 
some types of products like uh, food and, and drugs and stuff like this, they just give people cash. And it appears to be working in the poorest places around the world, like in the poor places from India. People actually consume less alcohol, less tobacco, they invest in themselves, they start uh, small uh, entrepreneurial businesses, uh, they invest in the education of their children. So if this would be, let's say, one of the worries that people would have, that if the poorest people of them all would receive a lump sum of money on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. they would just spend it on alcohol and uh, cigarettes, yeah. right? We do have some empirical evidence at least that people would do it different, right? Mm -hmm. And we could actually experiment with some not so costly ways of designing a basic income. As I previously said, I'm more in favor with the libertarian approach and framework. And you could do it not necessarily by actually giving people money in the sense in which Philip Van Parijs, for example, says it, but in, in, in certain schemes and forms of a negative income tax. So you have, let's say, a wider variety of, of potential solutions towards, towards this. Uh, whenever we think about public policies, we generally tend to think about the perfect potential yeah. public policy, right? It's the so-called nirvana fetus. Yeah. We generally tend to compare some sort of a present solution that we have to this ideal yeah. thing, perfect. right? I think that this is from a purely methodological standpoint when it comes to building public policies. That this is flawed, this is fundamentally flawed, right? We shouldn't think about the comparing what we have to ideal situations. We should compare it in comparison to the other alternatives that we have at our, at our disposal, right? This might be a better alternative than what we presently see when it comes to, I don't know, modern welfare states. It could actually be better, right? My name is Hayo Greif. I am a philosopher working on issues in artificial intelligence, especially in the context of um, the philosophy of computer simulation in the context of the history of artificial intelligence, especially um, the relationship between early art artificial intelligence and cybernetics. Um, and I have affiliations with Technical University of Munich in Germany and with Warsaw University of Technology in Poland. That's a big word with many, many meanings. So transparency is, um, it's a term that is important to um, the philosophy of computer simulation, where we talk about epistemic trans transparency, which I think is a very different thing uh, than um, what you see in surveillance te technologies. To uh, let me elaborate on this a little bit. Um, so one issue about, uh, uh, about transparency is that we don't really know what's going on inside this computer because its structure, its uh, processes are so complex that, they, that an observer cannot grasp just from looking at the, at, the, at the output or looking at the processes, trying to monitor the processes. Um, the human observer cannot really know what's going on. Uh, human being might also not be able to make sense of the output in some cases. So sometimes you get really strange images which are really fancy and psychedelic even. Um, when actually its task was supposed to be image classification. Or, um, and so we don't know what's going on there. Um, this is a problem, of course, in terms of making this, this uh, system um, explainable in an epistemic sense. So um, if we want a model to be valid, we better know what's going on in there. If it goes wrong, we want to know why it has gone wrong. And then there are uh, other questions that are loosely tied to, to this epistemic issue that are also called transparency problems in terms of, well, do we really see what these systems are doing to us uh, as human beings? So if they are used in, in, in tracking human behavior, um, if they are used, for example, in autonomous driving, um, the, the, all these questions arise of who is responsible if there is a crash and somebody is hurt. Um, and we want, of course, we want to know what went wrong in, uh, in the model that this system built of its environment, why it mistook uh, the pedestrian for a bicycle, for example, which has really happened uh, in that case. Um, so the, um, the, uh, the sensors only, discover, uh, only saw the, the bicycle, not the person pushing it. Um, so, of course, we want to know what went wrong in, that, in, in the model. Um, 
But the more important question in terms of transparency and ethical terms is whom do we hold, hold responsible in this case? And there are many questions uh, to be asked about how the system was programmed, how it was set up, how it was monitored. We want explanations perhaps from the system, we want uh, to have explanations about the system's behavior, but we might also want to have explanations about the testing scenario which has, which has much less to do with how the AI was programmed. But uh, um, that's questions of governance, um, of precaution, um, that, that might have been properly asked in that context. And we cannot blame the system on, uh, for that. Well, certainly there's a lot of different kinds of transparency are relevant. One of the most successful technologies nowadays is called deep learning. And it's fabulous in its ability to work with large databases and abstract general patterns and make inferences. One problem is it, it's not always easy to see how it's making those inferences because the inferences are a black box. They're buried in millions of neurons. So that's one kind of transparency. Uh, another kind of transparency has to do with wondering what governments are doing. In China, for example, there's increasing use of surveillance technology to track people's activities all the time. And that's really a reduction in people's need for autonomy. Fabio Fossa, I'm a philosopher. I studied philosophy at the University of Pisa. And my work is about artificial intelligence ethics and the way in which the line between artificial and human agency gets blurred. I think that um, in the way artificial intelligence is developing, Autonomy is a very big deal. It's actually one of the most important trends in the development of artificial intelligence. And in my opinion, higher degrees of autonomy are, well, they, they may be in contrast with our need to take control and to hold control over our um, products, right? Over our um, technologies. And one problem in, in this, in this uh, domain is that it is not very easy to integrate human judgment and machine functioning because human judgment and machine functioning actually happens on very different level of complexity of speed so it is not very easy to integrate these two parts of machine functioning and so in my opinion one way that we have to regulate the autonomy of artificial agents is to try and implement values directly into them. So the idea is not to delegate to the user or to the human operator every moral choice that may be necessary for the machine to function in a way which, that is aligned with our values, um, but to try and build machines that, while functioning, already implement such, kind, uh, such values, right? Already functions in a way that we deem uh, appropriate from a moral perspective. And I know that this might, this might sound strange because um, obviously machine cannot be as moral as we are, and this is a big problem in machine ethics, but I don't think that the only concept that we have of an, an artificial moral agent, so it's called the technology, is a concept that blurs um, the line between what can be achieved through machines and what a human moral agent is, right? So I think that there is much work to do in the definition of this um, notion. Well, it's always hard to put them in an order because often they have to be balanced out in different circumstances. But I think the way that we can get an objective view of value, one that is really tied into the nature of human beings and human biology, is to look at needs. So we all have the same needs for uh, for oxygen, for food, for water, for shelter when it's cold. And so those are objective needs. When people don't meet those needs, they suffer harm. And so that can go across the board. And so if you're going to have a robot that's capable of killing people, then it's taking away its life. And so that's a really clear case. The needs that are harder to identify are the ones that are based on psychology. But there's lots of evidence from psychology that people have needs for autonomy, which is a need for freedom. And AI is a big threat to that value because of the surveillance aspects. Uh, but there are also humans have a need for relatedness. That is, they have a need to belong to groups and get along with other people. And so AI needs to be used in a way that's going to foster human relationships rather than, than 
and challenge it by making people suspicious for, for each other. Uh, the other uh, really important human need is one for for competence, which means being able to achieve things, to accomplish things. This is where the work aspects of AI is particularly threatening, because if a lot of productive, satisfying human jobs are taken over by artificial intelligence systems, then individuals lose the capacity to satisfy this need for competence. The research presupposes that we have values to implement in the machine, that it is clear that some values must be implemented in uh, a given machine, in a given artificial agent, and this is obviously not the case. Um, it is not the case if we take a very wide perspective, so perhaps we, we could say that worldwide it, it would be very difficult to find some values that every culture um, deem worthy of respect and deem worthy of being implemented in the technology, but I don't think that this perspective may be the right one. We should conceive the process of, implement, of value implementation in the technology on a context-related basis, right? So it's not, well, I, ideally, it, it, it's not one technology that is designed in one way and then used all over the world, but it's just a basic technology that gets specified within the culture that that use it, right, that wants to deploy it. And perhaps even different values may be important in different contexts, even in, in inside the same cultural dimension, right? So yes, there is this big uh, problem, which is specification, but I think that this is more a practical issue than a theoretical issue, right? So um, I think that this is, a, I would say, a second stage of machine ethics uh, and maybe something that we will have to discuss when we will have elaborated um, a, a, a good theoretical approach to it. I think we are still struggling to understand which are the main concepts in this area and how they have to be determined. Well, it's certainly a big problem because philosophers have argued for centuries about what the best ethical theory is. I think that the need principle is a good one, look careful about human needs. But there's already work going on in AI where people are concerned about what principles you should be following and all these different companies like Google are putting out their own set of principles. What hasn't been done yet, since these principles have only been developed in the last couple of years, is a close examination to see how much do they agree, how much do they disagree, and how much do they make sense. So I'm actually planning to do this as a project over the next few months, to go through these 10 different sets of principles and try to figure out how, whether they're, if, if, if they all agree, then it's easy. You think, oh, there are a common set of principles that we can digest and put them all together, and that would be really great. I suspect there's going to be some conflicts, and I think they probably are going to reduce down to a f much smaller set of principles that are used in fields like medical ethics. The four principles usually used in medical ethics are justice, autonomy, beneficence, that is doing good, <clears throat> and non-maleficence, that is don't do harm. I'm guessing that the hundred or so different principles that people in AI have been talking about will fall under those. So there needs to be some serious examination of the principles and it may turn out there's actually quite a lot of agreement there among the different companies and the different governmental agencies that are currently trying to present views of ethics. I'm hoping there'll be lots of agreement. If that's true, then you can look at the productive overlap and use that as a guide that everyone can adopt in trying to figure out how to use AI in society. It's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, we've been asking this question since uh, Galileo and Copernicus first <laughs> suggested changes to uh, their astronomical view of how the solar system worked. For me, it's all about seeing the two working together. Um, I don't think that any kind of technological advancement can be safely deployed or used without ethical understanding of where that goes, whether it's to do with human reproductive technologies, whether it's to do with human enhancement or even um, fully autonomous artificial agents. This is something that we need to really think about um, before we give them the go-ahead. And I think it's important we do that now, uh, before the agents do come into being. There was. Um, an interesting parallel that I read recently with the tobacco industry in the United States and the electronic gambling industry, how once these products have 
been created and they've entered the market, uh, they're very difficult to regulate. You can get pressure groups, you can get economic interests coming in and trying to manipulate how the legislature works and regulates these new technologies and products. It's much easier to do that before these products come into being. There's definitely a role for ethics in any commission that's discussing an ethical question because uh, empirical science can't tell you what you ought to do. Um, there's that they can provide the facts which can be the basis for what you ought to do but you need to have the ethical judgment as to what values you have or what's right or wrong in these situations. Uh, but the problem you described is, is exactly what initially happened with bioethics as well, that the first committees and commissions to look at ethical questions raised by new developments in medicine, um, like for example uh, the definition of death when we got respirators that could keep people breathing uh, even though their brains had been destroyed. Um, they also did not have ethicists. They had lawyers or doctors, um, maybe theologians. Um, but yeah, and I think bioethics advanced considerably once it was recognised that you needed to have professional ethicists on these commissions. Ethics, I think, needs to be there before science arrives there. Uh, we need to have an understanding of the implication of um, new technologies before the new technology actually arrive. Because if we understand that implications of uh, new technology are bad and we should avoid them at all costs, um, then we should prevent science to develop this new technology. I think something like that has been done um, when uh, cloning technology uh, were developed um, and then it stopped because the um, opposition from well philosophers, but like society at large, uh, was so strong that governments decided to um, some, ban some governments. Some governments, <laughs> most governments in the Western world, decided to ban yeah. cloning. Now, oh, the moral philosophy is absolutely crucial. The empirical side can provide valuable information about how people behave and how how their bodies work, but. These are really questions of values, and we're trying to figure out what ought to happen here. These are questions of ethics. It's not just how things are, it's how things ought to be. And that's really what ethics is concerned about. So you can't dodge ethics here. You're making really important decisions about how people's lives can operate, for good or for bad. I'm generally skeptical that both ethicists, or moral philosophers, and scientists could actually address this issue single-handedly. I'm more in favor of a pluralistic, interdisciplinary approach because I don't think that you could actually be an applied ethicist without actually having access or knowing what happens in certain fields of, of knowledge, let's say, or, or science, right? And likewise, some scientists constantly have some curious and du dubious uh, biases, for example. Uh, some of them having to do with questions of justice, having to do with question of questions of know, discrimination, for example. And in order to address them better, we would actually need some form of a framework in which we would have applied ethicists and, and scientists, regardless of the fact that we're talking about, I don't know, earth science or, or uh, I don't know, research in, in IT or in artificial intelligence, right? And I guess this, that this is actually what, what happens in the world. Even, even private companies like Google, for example, one of the highest paying position in Google is basically the ethicist that Google has. It, I mean, we don't necessarily see it all the time when it comes to the way in which Google behaves, but the simple fact that they allocate some resources towards this signifies that they do see some sort of benefit. My name is Sabina Leonelli. I'm a professor of philosophy and history of science at the University of Exeter. And uh, my work looks at the history and the philosophy of data practices. So what I do is particularly within the realm of research, and particularly within biology and biomedicine, look at how researchers um, deal with data, how data are collected and produced, how data are disseminated and curated across many different databases, and how data are being reused for a variety of purposes. I'm particularly interested in how we obtain knowledge from data systems and what implications these practices we're using to do that have 
for society at large, for our politics, and for the ways in which research is set up at the global level. So um, the way in which uh, very often people think about artificial intelligence is a system which um, is really focused on extracting knowledge from data. So what matters is uh, the algorithms that you use to do that and the extent to which we can improve that process of knowledge extraction. One of the things that people very often underestimate is the importance of the empirical input, so the data you actually put into the system to start from. There is this idea that big data, because they're so large and because we have data about so many different things, actually are in some sense comprehensive, so actually they can tell us something about all of the reality around us and therefore that we don't really need to worry about which data go into artificial intelligence systems because more or less there is data about everything. And in fact, a lot of my work demonstrates the exact opposite, that the big data that go into artificial intelligence very often cause many problems down the line because the information that you put into these systems is very partial, is very biased, and is very limited. It's everything but comprehensive. And so a lot of my work tries to trace the link between the empirical input for, for um, artificial intelligence systems, so the data that go into those systems, and what actually comes out of them. So the big problem is that um, whenever you talk about big data, a lot of judgments made by lots of different people around the world for very different reasons go into establishing what actually are the data that are packaged and available so that they can go into a computational system. And that already is a huge source of bias. And this, of course, I mean, this is not a new issue in the history of science or the history of research. Data have always been coming from a particular perspective. But what is worrying about what's going on now in artificial intelligence is that very often it's impossible to trace the source of bias. So it's very difficult to find an account for why is it that uh, certain judgments have been made in deciding which data goes into the system and which not. And that, I think, is where the problem is. It's not so much the fact that there are lots of human judgments involved in determining what counts as big data, but it's the fact that that set of human judgments are not really accountable, they're not transparent, and they're very often uh, completely forgotten by the time the data actually enter the artificial intelligence systems. I'm Pete Alakivi from University of uh, Helsinki, Finland. I'm a philosopher, philosopher of mind, and my view is extended mind, so uh, it means that the mind is not only in the brain, but it's also uh, in our bodies, uh, our minds are embodied, and also in the environment, so in the tools we use, for example. And I'm interested in artificial intelligence because I'm interested how uh, the minds are created and my claim is that in order to have a mind we also need a body so that's why robot is a better example to have an artificial mind than a computer is. Uh, well nowadays machines are obviously not conscious because they are not even intelligence. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, it's not real intelligence. Uh, and it's something uh, totally different. But in principle, I think, yes, it's, it's not impossible. It is an empirical question. I think there are no uh, a priori reasons why, why something um, that is created by humans couldn't uh, become conscious or create a mind because um, I don't think that biology is the only way to, to create uh, consciousness. I think some or many of the research that is done in artificial intelligence uh, is is too much concentrated on computation and like manipulation of symbols. And I think that's that's the wrong way to go because I think uh, our minds are more basic or the basic thing in having like mental, uh, mental states is 
based on this very basic interaction between uh, the agent and its environment. So I think uh, that would be a better way to go, to look very simple sensory motor interactions between the agent and its environment, like for example robots, how they uh, are uh, functioning in their environment. Uh, yes, so I think uh, the uh, computer metaphor that has been very influential in the last, let's say, 50 years uh, in, in our society and in our science has really affected how we see human mind and, and mental uh, actions altogether. And, and I think we have got, went wrong in that. And instead of thinking about this computation and computers, we, th we should uh, think about our bodies because we are clearly embodied beings and that's how, that's how our uh, minds are built. So I think to create like an artificial mind, we should build a body. And that's what robots, of course, already have. Robots have a body. So in order to have a mind, you need to have a body. And uh, because everything we do is, is bodily and we have our own uh, bodily uh, subjective point of view to the environment. Um, so brain in a vat scenarios wouldn't do that, that kind of cases. Well, some people think that it will just turn out that robots are conscious by accident. It'll be some emergent property. There's a science fiction novel that supposes that the internet will turn out to be conscious entirely on its own as some kind of emergent property. But I don't think that's terribly plausible. What's more likely, I think, is we're going to keep on learning more and more about human brain, figure out what are the mechanisms that produces consciousness in the human brain. We already have some good ideas. One theory says it's a matter of a global broadcast from some brain areas to another. I think that's probably part of it. My own theory of consciousness is that there are particular kinds of neural representations that are formed partly from sensory motor experience, but then compete with each other to see which is going to be the aspect of consciousness. So I'm guessing if you combine some of these ideas, the broadcast idea and the competition idea, then you might get a theory of how consciousness works in the brain, tied in with the kinds of bodies that humans do. Once you've got a good theory like that, then you can start to think about how you might get consciousness in a robot if you want to. Now, I think that's an ethical question right there. Do we actually want robots to become conscious? If they become conscious, then you have to worry about them experiencing pain and suffering. Then you have to start worrying about whether they have rights, whether they have needs themselves. Right now, computers don't have any needs. They're just machines. But if they become conscious, if they're capable of emotions, then they become capable of needs, and we have to have ethical obligations toward them. Frankly, I just assume that society makes a decision not to do that. So even if we can figure out how to make computers conscious, we can simply decide, oh, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do the things that would enable a computer to be conscious, given what we know about human consciousness. So you should have a bunch of, of handicaps you put in place. So you simply decide, um, in the same way you don't build a car that can go uh, 500 kilometers an hour, and you could do that, it's technologically feasible, but you don't want a car going that fast down the highway. Similarly, you don't want to build a computer that is so sentient, so conscious, so emotional that it has needs and therefore has rights and we have moral obligations to them. So that's where I think we need to make really important value decisions about what not to do. Uh, because to think that mind is something that is stored in our brain and then we can just download it somewhere, I think that idea is wrong. So I think we are more than our brains. Our minds are more than our brains. It's also in our bodies and in our actions within our environment. So um, that kind of thing that we could just remove our mind from our head is a sort of Cartesian uh, uh, inheritance. And I don't think that's possible. Well, I think this is going to be uh, I think this is inevitable, that um, we can already see uh, human longevity, human health has, has um, improved immensely through uh, technological uh, development and distribution of, 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 of 
of technology globally. Historically, we can see the, the tech, um, you know, human uh, culture and human technology uh, have, have greatly benefited you know, human beings in terms of our lifespan, our, our ability to uh, avoid hunger uh, and uh, to avoid disease. So I think this is um, a trajectory that we're already on with our technology and I think um, um, if you know any 90 year olds, I have some friends who are 90 year old, uh, I know some of them uh, wish that they have more years. I wish that, you know, that they had more healthy years ahead of them because they still have you know, very vibrant and active minds and they still have much to contribute to society and in this case they regret they're dying. They know they're dying and, and they regret it. The idea of, of uh, extending uh, life you know, to the maximum extent that, that is possible with our technology, I, yes, I think, you know, if we can do it, we will do it. Um, and I think, um, uh, to, to me, this um, it, it will also, you know, begin to introduce this ethical question of, of um, the choice to end life. Right? And we already, uh, we do have situations like this now where, where people um, have viable, you know, physical uh, life ahead of them, um, but estimate that the quality of that life is so low that they, they would rather uh, choose to die. Um, this will become, I think, more, more of an issue in the future for more people. I like what Woody Allen said. He said, I don't want immortality through my work, I want immortality through not dying. And so there are people in AI who think that they're not going to ever have to die because they can be uploaded into a computer. So for example, Ray Kurzweil, who's the chief engineer of Google, thinks that it's only a matter of time, maybe a decade, before there'll be enough computer capacity that he can be immortal because he could have robots explore his brain, figure out all the brain connections, and then live forever. That strikes me as really implausible. For one thing, it's not just a matter of your synaptic connections that enable you to think in certain ways, it's also a matter of how you can feel, how you can have emotions, how you can have pleasure and pain. And that really depends on the body. And I think that the idea that you can simply transform yourself into a computer is neglecting a lot of what it is to be human. So I think the idea of immortality through uh, uploading into a computer is, first of all, technologically very implausible, and secondly, not at all very attractive. So that kind of immortality doesn't appeal to me at all. Well, there's no reason to think that um, this particular point in evolution has produced the best human beings that could ever exist. So I have no objection in principle to using technology to enhance certain abilities. Um, uh, you know, uh, Arguably, we should try and get everybody's sight up to normal, I suppose. That should be a higher priority than getting some people's sight to super normal. But I don't have any objection to people having enhanced sight or hearing or um, you know, other, other abilities. Uh, and I don't think we should be too hung up with the idea of, you know, is this still human or not? We should be rather looking at what is the kind of beings who can have the best life, who can do the most good for others. Uh, those should be the key questions. I think that as we are now, as we humans, as a species are, we don't really stand a good chance to extend our lifespan um, for more than a few hundred years in the most optimistic um, hypothesis, but at probably like a few more than 100 years. So I think that, I think that life is good, and that it's probably good to live way longer than we currently do. Um, I don't know if immortality is good, but I'm very much in favor of extending the lifespan um, by uh, millennial, probably. I think that we can achieve uh, a lot during the, our lives and that life doesn't necessarily become boring and bad after 100 years or 200 years. Yeah, well, robots already are creative, so there already are robots that can paint, 
and maybe they're not Picasso, but they paint better than I do. <laughs> uh, there already are computers that can generate music way better than most people can. There already are computers that can generate creative new moves in games like Go and chess. That's really very impressive. Uh, so that's creativity already exists. Is there creativity at the level of humans? Well, no, there's not been a great robot scientist yet. So I think that's something for well off in the future, but it's not out of the question. I'm dead certain that something like this will happen because it already happens. Um, there's this composer from the States, I, I kind of forgot his name, I'm really sorry for this. Uh, he made this like really interesting experiment. So he programmed an artificial intelligence to basically learn from the ways in which like Beethoven and other composers composed and compose something itself. He rented, uh, I don't know, something like the Opera House or something like this from, from Los Angeles. Uh, he called people there, they went there, they auditioned it. And at the end of the show, he asked them if they liked it. They said, yes, who do you think composed this? They were like, I know, some human composer? And he was like, no, no, no. This was composed by an artificial intelligence with deep machine learning. This is how you had access to this, this cultural products. And there's even an additionally more interesting example of an artificial intelligence that writes haikus, Japanese haikus. Mm -hmm. And it's a tremendous task. It's this, it, there's this book, half of the haikus are published, are uh, written by an artificial intelligence, half by humans. And basically the task would be whether or not you would be able to discern between the haikus written by an AI during tests for us, actually. And actually, most people are unable to do it. So if this would happen, sure, I mean, it would be a different type of creativity. We could still say that there's something missing there, absolutely. I don't think that we should conceive machine creativity having in mind human creativity as a model. I think that it would be best to understand it in its own terms, right? Because if we start doing analogies and uh, um, you know, simil similitudes between uh, the human way of creating art and the machine way, if there is a machine way to create art, I think we're, we're actually losing the point. Um, this is something that applies also outside the domain of machine creativity and it is an argument that could be made also for artificial intelligence, um, human and artificial intelligence or human and artificial morality. I think that what is missing in this debate is uh, an effort to define machine creativity on its own terms. So starting from what we know about the technological object we have in mind, in this case, artificial agents, right? And, um, and this is interesting because, in my opinion, if you move from an understanding of the artificial artist um, as a tool or as a way to visualize data, then you really enter into a domain which is entirely new because the only um, instances that we have of entities that do what these um, machines do. Uh, and yes, if you do this, you have um, a really new perspective on what is going on and a perspective that could um, change the way in which we understand what uh, a work of art is. I, I, th that's the point in my opinion. Um, we should, well, artificial creativity may help us redefine what we believe is a work of art, but I don't think that this should help us also redefine what human creativity is. This kind of a reflection from machine creativity to human creativity, in my opinion, is a bit misleading. Um, because it is based on the idea, on the presupposition, that there is a sort of continuity between these two, between these two um, phenomena. Uh, while this continuity can be uh, very well denied, in my opinion at least.
Yes, Hitchbot, the hitchhiking robot. Um, this is a project um, inspired by conversations between myself and uh, my collaborator, uh, Dr. Fauke Zeller. Um, and uh, the idea uh, was assembled through um, a, f a few different uh, types of conversations. Uh, in one case, we were looking at uh, artistic applications uh, for robots. And there was also uh, this idea of the uh, kind of autonomous um, traveler the, or a voyager. Uh, so um, humanity has sent um, voyager satellites um, you know, to explore the solar system. Uh, we have a Mars rover you know, to explore the surface of the moon. And older ideas, uh, we have this uh, message in a bottle you know, that the, this kind of hopeful casting of, of some meaningful message, uh, you know, into the ocean and letting the currents, uh, you know, take the, the message uh, to, to someone else. And, and then the hope is that you might hear back, you know, from this, from this activity. Um, so we were thinking about uh, what kind of a robot we could make in 2000 and 2013, 2012, 2013, that could actually be uh, let loose in the world without our supervision, um, uh, as a as a traveling, uh, as a traveler. And uh, so this is where we started to think about uh, well, how would the robot actually travel? You know, um, would it need to have its own mobility system? And this is where uh, I was reading a lot about um, you know, theories of embodied uh, cognition, extended mind, distributed cognition. And these are the ideas that um, you know, human beings have offloaded or invested um, yeah, meaningful or meaning uh, into our, our environments. And we have also uh, in some ways offloaded um, uh, performance to our technologies as well. So I was thinking about uh, how a robot uh, might be able to take advantage of this extended mind, um, relying on, the, uh, on intelligence that's actually in its environment. So that means that now we have human intelligence that we can tap into. So the robot, near, uh, in this case, merely needs to signal in some way that it, it is a hitchhiker and it needs to be able to communicate um, you know, with the human intelligence where it wants to go. Um, so the project um, you know, was built with this kind of uh, interlocking um, abilities in, in mind. Um, so that's the source of, of the project. And uh, the project was nicely framed by uh, Dr. Zeller. Um, with this reversal of a typical dystopian question that we ask about the future of, of robots and, and humans, and that is, will humans be able to trust robots? And uh, uh, she merely reversed that and says, well, you know, will robots be able to, you know, to trust humans? Um, and I think this is an interesting question, uh, and it, I think more properly frames the inclusion of technology in human social conceptual space. The biggest mistake, um, make sure not to burn my fingers here, <laughs> um, I think um, the biggest mistake would be to repeat past mistakes. The biggest mistake would be to just try to simulate the human brain with, without all the other stuff, without all the embodiment, without all the uh, environmental embeddedness. Um, perhaps the biggest mistake would still to take the metaphor of the, of the computational mind too literally um, and to think that we can achieve something like an artificial intelligence that is, that is conscious, that is human-like um, and everything that comes with it. Um, so, and I think many of the contemporary debates, debates on AI, not, it's not really AI, what AI research is doing, 
um, but the, the, like the public perception is too much focused on singularity, whether machines become more intelligent as, uh, than us, whether they become too similar to us, or perhaps too alien um, to be grasped, um, too, too complex to be understood by human beings, uh, which is all fair enough, but um, I think this, this, this will lead us astray in, in, in many, many respects because it keeps us from looking what AI systems are capable of doing, whether they are still supposed to do intelligent problem solving, which is the, the vast majority of uh, AI applications uh, right now, because all those complex deep neural networks, these uh, systems are normally not supposed to um, simulate human cognitive processes. Um, what they normally do is solve problems that are too tedious, too complex to solve for human beings, uh, which, which is um, obviously uh, opens uh, a wide area of possible applications. Um, whereas only a subdomain, again, only a subdomain of these applications is concerned with uh, modeling human cognition or process in the hu uh, processes in the human brain. So, um, and that will mean we should not mistake um, the broad, uh, AI broadly conceived for this more narrow, um, of this more narrow uh, endeavor, which interestingly, it's, it's an anecdote that's, that's worth telling perhaps. Um, if you try to use uh, a deep neural network, this very powerful uh, and quite recent development uh, in, in, in a neural network modeling, if you want them to be realistic in terms of modeling um, processes in, in, in the human nervous system, you actually have to pare down in some cases, you have to pare down the capabilities of the system, so you have to artificially curtail its abilities in order to be more realistic in terms of being biologically realistic, of, uh, and being, uh, in terms of being a faithful model of how the human brain operates. Well, the existential risk that a lot of people are worried about is that computers are soon going to be so smart that they'll dominate us, that they'll be able to take over the world. We'll have, uh, some people call it the robot apocalypse, with robots, and there's been so many movies that show that, things like the Terminator movies or the Matrix movies. And lots of people like uh, Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking are extrapolating from current progress in AI to thinking that that's really quite close. I don't think it's true. I've done a fairly careful analysis of what's involved in human intelligence and what's involved in the best programs in current AI. And it seems to me from that that, that this all-powerful human-level AI is actually a long way off. Some people would say a hundred years rather than the ten years that other people are predicting. So I think in the short term, that is in the next hundred years, AI isn't nearly as big an existential risk as other risks that humans have from things like nuclear war, uh, climate change, epidemics. Those are all seem to be seri more serious uh, existential risks than we have from artificial intelligence. A hundred years from now, it might be different. Artificial intelligence could um, be malevolent and destroy um, all life on the planet, humans and um, every intelligent form of life. But I think that it's also possible that we will evolve as homo sapiens in different kind of species that is actually uh, merged with artificial intelligence and some people would consider that human extinction they would think that that's a bad outcome because uh, nobody looking like us and having the same kind of processes in their brain would would exist anymore but I'm not entirely convinced that that would be a bad outcome um, like we have evolved uh, from a previous species and it is possible that the development of a new species wouldn't necessarily um, happen like it happened before. Uh, it could just be that we um, develop a new artificial intelligence, new technologies that we can incorporate and merge with and become something better than we actually are. Would that mean human extinction? Yes. Uh, would that be a bad thing? No. Uh, so this is my optimistic um, scenario for what can happen. Of course, I'm not denying that it is dangerous. Things could go in a completely different way and, you know, nothing, nothing that shares the human values and um, human history and whatever it means to be human could replace us and be just very negative. Um, but I don't think it's the only possible scenario and I like to think that if we develop 
an artificial intelligence that um, is human in a way, can derive uh, from, from us, then we're just evolving in a different species and I don't have a particular attachment to the Homo sapiens species that I think that you know would be bad if we were replaced by a species that is more empathetic to other species for instance, uh, that is smarter, that is a greater capacity to experience happiness, that experience less pain or no pain, I think that would be great if my great 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 children were gonna be like that even though you know they look more like robots or the artificial intelligence that's good for them.